Welcome to CBS Prep Talk number eight. Glad to see a good crowd out here again in YouTube land. Uh, this is, like I said, the eighth CBS Prep Talk from the Cicerone Certification Program. I'm Master Cicerone Neil Witte, and I'm going to be talking to you today about beer style parameters, ABV, IBU, SRM, and a couple of other things. So this is the eighth one of a 12 session series of informational videos designed to help you boost your beer knowledge uh, and potentially to help you take and pass the certified beer server exam. Uh, these are kind of general, uh, general oversight informational videos about some select topics. Uh, I did see a question in the chat just before we started uh, asking if uh, if you watch all 12 of these, if you have all the information necessary to take and pass certified beer server, uh, we don't have enough time to cover all that potential content. So if you are preparing for a certified beer server, uh, you probably need to study a little bit more, do a little bit more preparation, but this is going to get you a great start. Um, as I mentioned, there are 12 of these. Uh, this is number eight. Uh, we're doing these every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, so being number eight, we've got four more left. The last one is going to be on Thursday, May 28th. So... Uh, Hopefully you're tuning in. All the previous ones are posted at uh, the Cicerone YouTube channel. You can watch the past ones if you haven't seen all of them. If you have tuned in before, thank you for returning. Uh, if you tuned into the last one on proper glassware and pouring techniques, thank you uh, for showing up again. Uh, for those of uh, you out there who are Spanish speakers, uh, Chema Mora, our business development manager for Latin America, is doing these same talks uh, on the Cicerone Facebook page every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, so you can tune in and catch those. Uh, he is several episodes behind where I'm at. Uh, so uh, um, you can look for him there. Uh, so a couple of couple of things we're, we're doing uh, in conjunction with this. Uh, we've got review questions that we've been posting every week on our Cicerone blog that are questions that are designed for you to help follow along with these prep talks. Uh, so you can follow along, you can quiz yourself afterwards with the questions, uh, quiz your friends or whatever, use them as a study aid. Uh, and we'll post the answers to those questions at the beginning of the next session. So the questions you'll find for today's session will be posted at the beginning of Tuesday's session. And so the questions on glassware from Tuesday are now posted at the blog site for you to review. Um, so to get there, uh, all you need to do is go to our blog. There's a link uh, that just got uh I think, uh, was that posted in the chat? Yeah, there it is posted in the chat. Uh, it'll get posted in the chat again. Uh, or if you want to navigate to uh, cicerone.org, and at the top of the homepage, there's a link to our blog there, and you can find those questions. Um, so uh, there's some great stuff in that blog, too, some cool articles. Uh, you know, I just uh, we just posted one that I wrote about uh, starting up draft system after hibernation. Um, some good timely topics there. Uh, we're cranking out a ton of great content at Cicerone uh, for everybody out there. Uh, we've got a bunch of great stuff on our YouTube channel where you all are right now. Uh, so if you want to check out more stuff, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, get access to lots of cool Cicerone content. Um, another cool thing we're doing along with this is Every session of the CBS Prep Talks, we are giving away 10 certified beer server exams. It's a $69 value. Uh, we've done seven talks so far, so we've given away 70 exams so far. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, all you have to do to enter is fill out a short questionnaire. The link to that questionnaire is going to be posted 
at the beginning of the question and answer session today. So once I start q and I'll give you a little reminder, and then the link to that will be posted in, in the chat. Um, and you'll have until typically 3 p.m. Central Time, so about an hour and a half roughly after it posts, you'll have time to fill it out. It'll close after that. Um, so you'd fill that out, um, and you'll be entered to win a, a free certified beer server exam. Um, we do ask that uh, if you are already a certified beer server to please not enter. Uh, save those free exams for the people who still need them. And if you are already a winner, if you're one of the 70 people who have won, uh, don't enter again because you can't win twice. Uh, when you do enter, make sure you are typing your email address in correctly. Uh, we don't want it to bounce. So we'd hate for you to have an opportunity to win and just have a typo be the difference between you being able to collect your prize and not. Um, so as I've been doing each time, uh, here's the winners from Tuesday, first names only. We've got Juan, Emily, Matthew, Lewis, Todd, Melanie, Ken, PJ, Arlene, and Corey. Congratulations uh, for winning your free certified beer server exam. Okay. Uh, so I, I am getting a note that there's a little bit of crunchiness in my volume. Hopefully uh, a little shift around can help here. So I'm going to try and speak a little more slowly and clearly uh, so everyone can tell what I'm saying. I'd hate for it to be screwed up for everybody out there. Um, so I'll look for a few more notes to make sure that everything is fine. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into the content. Um, we are talking today about beer style parameters, ABV, IBU, and SRM. Some of the things that we, uh, some of the things that we use to differentiate between different styles of beer. Um, so when we talk about the beer styles in Cicerone, we're talking about the styles as they are outlined in the Beer Judge Certification Program guidelines. So there are a couple of different organizations that, uh, that keep and publish style guidelines. And these uh, really originally were published mainly for purposes of competition for classifying beers in different competitions. So one organization that publishes beer style guidelines is the Brewers Association. This is the trade group for craft brewers and they have their own set of guidelines that they use for the Great American Beer Festival and World Beer Cup. Um, the Beer Judge Certification Program has their own style guidelines. And this organization has been around for a long time publishing. Uh, they've had uh, guidelines for a long time. And what they do is they certify uh, judges for competition. And they also sanction homebrew competitions. And they publish comprehensive style guidelines for use in those competitions. Um, they've got oh, well over 100 styles categorized. Uh, you know, depending on how you slice it up, if you include historical beers and some of the subcategories, but they've got a whole lot of styles outlined. And these are the guidelines that we use in the Cicerone certification program for all of our education and our examinations. So uh, if you want, if you're studying beer style information for one of our exams, for the certified beer server exam, or one of our more advanced exams, then you need to be studying the BJCP uh, style guidelines. You can go to bjcp.org and download, uh, the, download the guidelines for free. Um, all right. Uh, so let's talk about one of the first parameters that BJCP uses to talk about the difference between 
uh, difference between styles. And this is a pretty basic one that everybody is aware of is alcoholic content. So when we talk about alcohol and beer, we use alcohol by volume or ABV. Uh, so this is uh, as a percentage of the total volume of liquid. Uh, and this is uh, the way that most people talk about alcoholic content is ABV percentage. There are some instances where you will come across uh, alcohol by weight, which is a different measurement and it's a different number. Alcohol by weight is rarely used in regular conversation, uh, but uh, it's mainly used uh, in, in certain types of laws and regulations and state laws that they have on the books that regulate alcohol. Specifically, if you live in a state that has or used to have three, two laws, there were several laws that were written uh, around uh, the alcoholic strength of beer uh, and the level of 3.2 ABW. So there were certain alcoholic strengths that couldn't be sold in certain channels and certain like grocery stores or convenience stores. And they would use the three, two percentage by weight as the kind of cutoff of what was considered to be strong beer or not. Um, most of those laws don't really exist anymore. A lot of them have very recently been abolished. Um, but that's, that's typically the context where you would see ABW. So all of the conversation that we have at Cicerone, all of our education, all of the testing, and everything that you're going to find on BJCP is ABV. Uh, just so you know what the reference is for ABV versus ABW, ABV is a higher number. So uh, a 3.2 ABW beer is roughly equivalent to about a 4.0 ABV beer. Okay, so the next parameter uh, that, we, that we talk about is bitterness. And this is a term uh, that a lot of you have heard of already. Most of you probably have, it's IBU, International Bitterness Units. So these International Bitterness Units is literally a laboratory measurement of the bittering resins in beer. And this is a number that ranges from about one to 100. And there are measured numbers that can be higher than 100, but it's generally accepted that numbers above 100 are beyond the threshold of what the average person can taste. Uh, so some good reference points for, uh, for IBU uh, would be, you know, your typical American light lager beer, like a, like a Budweiser, for example, would be in, in the mid single digits, maybe five to seven IBUs, very low. Uh, something like a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is about 35 to 37 IBUs. And your average uh, IPA or double IPA can be upwards of 100 or more. Uh, so that's where you get into the really big bitterness is when you're up in, uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s and above. Um, and so when you get up to 100, again, uh, once you get past 100, you're getting past the point where you can really tell the difference between that. So if somebody gives you 100 IBU beer and then 130 IBU beer, you might not really be able to tell the difference between them. They're both just going to seem very bitter. Um, so this laboratory measurement of bitterness, this IBU number is really just kind of part of the picture. Uh, it doesn't tell us the complete picture of bitterness um, as, uh, as you experience it in beer, as it's perceived. So we talk about uh, something else as well, and especially at the certified ser uh, beer server level, we talk about perceived bitterness. And so perceived bitterness can be different than the actual measured bitterness because your perception of bitterness is affected by a number of other things that might be going on in the beer. So bitterness can, for example, be accentuated by carbonation. So if you have a higher carbonated beer, it's going to accentuate your perception of the bitterness. 
And bitterness can also be masked by big malt flavors. So if you have you know, a really rich, sweet, full-bodied beer, a lot of those malt characteristics can mask some of the bitterness. And so you might not perceive it as much in a beer like that. So a good example would be if you have, for example, a 40 IBU Pilsner beer and a 40 IBU Imperial Stout. A 40 IBU Pilsner beer is going to give the impression of, of a, a quite bitter beer. That bitterness is going to stand out quite a bit. Whereas the Imperial Stout has so much rich, roasty malt character and so much else going on that it can cover up some of the bitterness uh, in the beer. And so you won't perceive that 40 IBUs as much in that beer as you would with the Pilsner. So perceived bitterness is, uh, is maybe in, in certain contexts more relevant uh, to, uh, to your experience of drinking a beer. So the next parameter is color. So color is, uh, is outlined in BJCP by uh, something we call SRM. SRM stands for Standard Reference Method. And so this, again, is a number produced by laboratory analysis of the color of beer. Uh, so this laboratory analysis uh, gives us a number, and this is a, uh, an agreed-on method by, uh, by beer chemists. The American Society of Brewing Chemists has a method that gives us a standard number. This SRM number uh, assigns a number to the color that can be anywhere from, you know, the everyday language we might use would be straw or golden to amber to brown to black, but then there's number designations to that. So BJCP has a range of SRM from one to 40, one being very light straw color and 40 being black. Now, measured numbers of SRM can actually go far above 40. Uh, but a lot, but beyond 40, you're really talking about differences that you can't really see visually. So it's just degrees of black. In fact, you really have to do dilutions in a laboratory to be able to see the different shades of black and the different darkness. So uh, from a practical standpoint, from a stylistic standpoint, when we're talking about the different styles of beer, any discussion of SRM beyond 40 isn't really relevant. So 40 is black, and that's as high a number as you'll see on BJCP. So there's also uh, uh, another method and another number that could be used for measuring color, and that's EBC, stands for European Brewing Convention. Uh, so SRM is used primarily in the United States, whereas EBC is used in other countries around the world. Uh, there's a rough conversion method. Uh, EBC is roughly two times SRM. It's actually more like 1.97, but you know, for all intents and purposes, if you double the SRM number, you're pretty close to what that EBC number is. So those three uh, parameters, ABV, IBU, and SRM, are detailed for every single style in the Beer Judge Certification Program style guidelines. And you're going to find for each one an upper and lower limit of those numbers. And, uh, and so a beer that's brewed specifically to a style guideline that fits nicely into a style guideline will likely have ABV that fits in the range, IBU that fits in the range, and SRM that fits in the range. Um, as we all know, there are some beers that don't fit neatly into style categories, so some beers may not fit exactly in there. Uh, but these are parameters that BJCP has outlined for all of those. Uh, at the certified beer server level, we don't require you to memorize those upper and lower limits 
for purposes of examination. So we just ask that you understand these parameters from an everyday language standpoint. So for ABV, we would just ask you to know if it's uh, low, moderate, high, uh, and using everyday language. Uh, we would ask you to use everyday language with uh, SRM, golden, straw colored, amber, brown, black, uh, just everyday words like that. Uh, as you advance through the Cicerone certification program examinations, uh, certified Cicerone and beyond, we do ask that you memorize those parameters. And so you will need to know those for more advanced examinations. Um, so there are some other, uh, some other distinguishing characteristics that we talk about uh, when we're talking about styles, but that BJCP doesn't necessarily assign specific number ranges for. One of these is carbonation. So carbonation is literally the, the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the beer. Brewers measure this very specifically. Uh, and carbonation has obviously provides mouthfeel, a certain mouthfeel. Um, and carbonation, like I mentioned before, can enhance certain characteristics of beer like bitterness. So uh, carbonation is measured very specifically by brewers and they use uh, a measurement called volumes of CO2. Uh, so volumes is just simply a reference to, it basically means that it's the equivalent amount of gas in that will fill the same size vessel. So if you have a keg of beer that has uh, two and a half volumes of CO2, if you were to be able to magically take that two and a half, that just that gas out of the beer, it would at standard at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, it would fill up two and a half kegs just by itself. That's what volumes means. So that's the measurement that U.S. brewers primarily use for measuring CO2 in beers, volumes. Uh, outside of the U.S., you'll see a different scale used, and that's grams per liter. Um, so volumes in the U.S. and grams per liter, typically in Europe and in other countries. And we've got one other parameter that I want to talk about, and that's attenuation. And attenuation uh, is something that maybe not everybody has heard about. But this is uh, attenuation is the measurement of the amount of sugar that is consumed by yeast during fermentation. So if you remember back to the brewing process, fermentation is where yeast is eating sugar and creating alcohol. And so in the brewing process, we're creating those sugars that are food for the yeast. So we create a, a, a certain amount of sugars that go into the fermenter, but not all of those sugars are going to be consumed by the yeast. The yeast will only eat some of those sugars. Um, and so attenuation is really a measurement of how much of, the, of that sugar is being consumed. So a high attenuating beer, for example, means that there are more sugars being eaten by the yeast. It's highly attenuative. It's eating a lot of sugar. So if you have high attenuation where there's lots of sugar being consumed, the end result is that there's less sugar in the finished beer. So if you have less sugar in the finished beer, the beer is drier and a little bit lighter in body. So high attenuation produces a drier, lighter body beer. Now, if you have a low attenuating beer, a low attenuation in your beer, that means fewer sugars are being eaten and so the end result in the beer is that there's more sugar left behind, which creates a fuller body. So the general range of this is about 65% to 85%. So 65% attenuation where 65% of all the available sugars are consumed, that's very low. So if you have 65% attenuation, you are probably going to have uh, a fuller body beer. There's more sugar left behind. If you have 85% attenuation, that's very high. So that means there's less sugars available in the finished beer. So it's drier and lighter in body. 
So that's what we mean by attenuation. So by describing the attenuation, uh, you're going to have uh, a little bit, uh, you have an idea of uh, what the character of the finished beer is going to be. Okay. So uh, I haven't seen much more about the sound. I'm, imp I'm assuming that has been improved. Uh, I want to move on to a question and answer session. Uh, and before I get to that, I want to bring your attention to uh, the survey. If you want to enter to win one of 10 free certified beer server exams, uh, fill out the survey. There it is in uh, the chat right now. Click on that link, fill out the survey, and you're entered to win. This will be open until 3 p.m. Central. So in about an hour and a half, that is going to close. And uh, then you'll have to wait until Tuesday to try and win again. Um, so go ahead and fill that out. When this video is posted, after we're finished, the video will be posted on our YouTube channel and that link will continue to be open. It'll be in the description of the video. Okay, so let me go to some of these questions here. Um, um, all right. Uh, Christy asks, does ABV also affect perceived bitterness? If you had two beers with the same IBU, but one has higher ABV, will that affect the bitterness? Well, so ABV would be one of the factors that could, uh, could affect perceived bitterness for sure. So perceived bitterness is, is affected by how intense are all of the other characteristics in the beer. So if you have a really high alcohol content, that's going to create some warming sensation. It's going to have uh, a certain flavor associated with that. And that is going to potentially take away from your perception of the bitterness. Peter asks, what about weird colors like a fruited sour that's bright pink? So this is a, that's a really good question. Uh, typical beer colors are, uh, it are the way it's measured is by taking a, a certain size sample and shooting a particular wavelength of light through it and measuring how much is diffracted. And that, and so what we're measuring with beer is essentially how yellow is the beer and, and it's and so we're measuring within a pretty narrow spectrum because of the natural color that it's produced during malting uh, because we get color from the malt um, when you add other ingredients and add different colors it gets beyond what srm can accurately represent uh, so we don't really have good srm numbers for pink beers or blue beers or green beers or anything that's got something unusual that adds a different color. Um, Joe asks, is it possible to calculate or measure color and or bitterness as a home brewer without a laboratory? Uh, well, sure. So for, uh, you can get a reasonable approximation. So for color, you could just go back to the old way of doing things where they had, uh, you know, different swatches of color, uh, different color swatches with a number assigned to it. And you would hold the beer up to that, you know, hold different colors up to it until you found the color that matched it. And that was the number uh, that was uh, goes back to what was the old love a bond method. Um, you can get uh, you can find. Uh, SRM uh, color swatches out there on the internet. There's plenty of them out there. A quick Google search will bring up a whole bunch of them and, uh, and use that at home with your homebrew. And there's also uh, formulas you can use to approximate IBUs or the, or the bitterness levels in your beer. Uh, and that's all, all you have to know is the alpha acid content of your hops. So whenever you purchase hops, it should have al alpha acid content uh, as a percentage of that hop. 
Uh, those are the bittering resins. If you have that number and if you know how much you put in per gallon of wort uh, of that particular hop, then you can plug that into a formula. And those formulas are pretty widely available out there. Uh, if you go to, for example, John Palmer's How to Brew, there's he's got formula a formula on how to figure that out. Um, let's see. Justin says, can you name any commercial examples or style of high and low attenuated beers? Um, so uh, a lot of Belgian beers are highly attenuated beers. Uh, so one that I can think of in particular, which is a personal favorite of mine, is Duval. Uh, Duval is very highly attenuated. Uh, there's lots of sugars consumed by yeast, so it ends up very dry. Um, a typical, uh, the other end of the spectrum might be like a, an English barley wine. Uh, English barley wine has got a lot of residual sugar in it uh, and it's typically a little bit lower attenuated. And so you've got a lot fuller body in there. Um, Lisa asks, what's the range of carbonation in different beers? Yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have mentioned that, but carbon range of carbonation, uh, you know, can be anywhere from one to four volumes or more. Uh, so I will say that one is basically flat, uh, and four volumes is like soda pop level carbonations, very highly carbonated. Most beers reside somewhere in the about 2.2 volumes to 2.8 volumes. That's where you're going to find probably 95% of the beers out there. Uh, and most draft beer is going to be between probably 2.4 and 2.8 volumes of CO2. So that, that gives you kind of a reference point. Um, Jonathan asks, does attenuation correlate with ABV? Yes, it does. So uh, the more sugars that are consumed, and if you're if you have high attenuation, you're consuming more sugars. Those sugars are being converted to alcohol. So there's a direct link between attenuation and alcohol content. Ken asks, "What is the term gravity referring to?" So gravity is the term we use. Uh, in, when we're talking about how much sugar is in the wort or the beer. So these, this is uh, the gravity uh, will, is a measurement of that sugar. So when we start fermentation with the wort, before fermentation starts, we have a lot of sugar in the liquid. And so we're going to have a high gravity. And then as fermentation progresses, the gravity will continue to drop as there's fewer and fewer sugars. And then at the end of fermentation, we have terminal gravity. And that original gravity and the terminal gravity are going to give us an idea of what uh, that will allow us to figure out what the attenuation was of that beer. Uh, let's see. Does attenuation affect anything besides body? Does it affect flavor as well? Uh, so... Yeah, you've got sugars that are available for food, and if they're not consumed, you're going to have more sugar residing in the beer. And so there is going to be a, an increased uh, sweetness that goes along with that fuller body. Uh, so more or less sugar is going to affect the flavor just from a, a malt sweetness standpoint. Uh, but also if you have more residual sweetness and body, that's going to affect your perception of all of the other flavors of the beer as well. Josh asks, how does dry hopping affect attenuation? Uh, well, so the simple answer is that dry hopping uh, does not affect attenuation. Dry hopping is typically done after uh, fermentation is complete. Uh, but as a technical standpoint, there's a lot of research being done on 
a phenomenon called hop creep. And this is getting beyond certified beer server level content. Uh, but hop creep is a phenomenon where you have uh, further attenuation that takes place after you've dry hopped. And there is an effect that uh, we're starting to see with hops being added in fermentation that is affecting attenuation. But that's a, a technical uh, a little technical detail that is still being actively researched by researchers right now. It's actually a, a current research topic in beer, uh, not a certified beer server level uh, detail. Um, let's see, Christy asks, does a low attenuated beer cause a sugary feeling in the mouth, similar to the feeling you get after eating something really sugary? Um, well, you know, it really, I wouldn't say that it causes a sugary feeling in the mouth. Now, if you have, uh, some, if you have a beer that's very poorly attenuated, so maybe not attenuated, uh, uh if you have a real fermentation issue, uh, where the yeast is simply not doing its job, low attenuating fermentation can be acceptable. Uh, but if it's way too low, then you could have lots of residual sugar that uh, that could potentially give you uh, maybe a saccharin sweet kind of characteristic. Possibly. Depends on the context of the beer, really. Um, Kurt asks, what about OG versus FG? So I just answered that before. The original gravity, OG is, is original gravity, the starting point. Uh, FG is final gravity, also known as terminal gravity, uh, and that's the end point of gravity after fermentation. Uh, Zoltan asks, what about relative bitterness, BU versus GU? So we can take, uh, we can take bitterness units and put them in a context against the way that we measure gravity uh, and we can compare those as a type of ratio. Uh, so by looking at our measurement of, of gravity versus our measurement of bitterness, we can look at that in a ratio form and be able to tell what the balance of the beer might be. Is it balanced more towards the hot bitterness or is it balanced more towards that malt sweetness? Um, that's the short answer without getting too into the weeds of details on that. Uh, next question is, what gives the red color to a beer? Uh, so those of you who sat in Pat Fahey's talk yesterday, about Flanders Red may have caught this little tidbit in there where he was talking about uh, the use of black malt in certain beers. So if you use black malt in, a, in say, like a four or five or more percentage of your malt bill, you end up with a black beer. But if you take black malt and you use maybe a half a percent of black malt as a percentage of your malt bill, it can add a little bit of a red color to the beer. So that's one way that you could achieve uh, that red color. That red is kind of uh, right around in that amber spectrum and the use of certain malts, some crystal malts can give you that red color as well. Um, Kyle asks, could you go over how volumes of carbonation are measured? Uh, well, so we, there are different ways of measuring this. Uh, uh, there are devices that, uh, if you hold a sample in an enclosed container that has a thermometer and a pressure gauge on it, and you shake it all up based on the internal pressure of in that container and the temperature of the beer, you can take those two factors and figure out what the carbonation level is. And there are some, some solubility charts that have been produced by uh, brewing chemists that can tell you uh, what that carbonation level is based on pressure and temperature. Uh, we've reproduced some of those charts or in uh, the draft beer quality manual, which is another good study resource 
for uh, all of your Cicerone examinations. Uh, next question is from Kyle. Why do we care about IVU as they do not mean much for perceived bitterness? Uh, well, yeah, so uh, there are some contexts in which it's much more appropriate to talk about um, to talk about perceived bitterness. Um, you know, it can be argued that IBUs is more relevant for brewers when they are trying to make consistent beer from one beer to the next, uh, that if they're measuring IBUs, they know that they're hitting that bitterness level each brew they make. Um, but it is also part of our lexicon that we use to talk to each other, to give each other an idea as to how bitter or how not bitter a certain beer is. And so, you know, a lot of the terminology we use uh, is relevant as just being common language that, uh, that allows us to describe things more accurately. Uh, so is it the be all end all of, of the discussion of bitterness in a beer? Oftentimes, no. Um, is it useful in discussion with other people to say this is a 75 IBU beer as opposed to a 25 IBU beer? I would argue, yeah, that's, that's a useful uh, point of reference. Uh, next question. Do the yeast produce alcohol and rise ABV on second fermentation in the bottle? And how is that measured? So yes, that, that does happen. In bottle conditioning, where we have a secondary fermentation in the bottle, that fermentation uh, produces more alcohol. So it does slightly increase the ABV. Uh, now, brewers are measuring the, the sugar that they put in for bottle conditioning very specifically, and they know how much uh, alcohol will be produced by that amount of sugar addition. Uh, and they'll also have an idea of how much carbonation can be produced by that as well. And so they take that into consideration with their labeling. Um, Let's see. Next question from Dave. How do volumes change for nitro beers compared to carbonated beers? So your average nitro beer, uh, a nitro beer, if you don't know what that is, it has large amounts of nitrogen gas dissolved in it, as opposed to large amounts of CO2 with a regularly carbonated beer. Uh, so a nitro beer, even though the primary gas dissolved in a nitro beer is nitrogen, there still is a lower level of CO2 that's dissolved in there as well. Most measure, the measured levels of, of an average nitro beer is going to be somewhere between uh, 1.4 and 1.6 volumes of CO2. So that's very low. Uh, and it's for all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a flat beer from a carbonation standpoint. Uh, but when you pour a nitro beer and you pour it properly and you get that gas break out and the cascade of bubbles, part of that action is dependent on that low level of CO2 as well. Um, Nathaniel asks, is there really such a thing as a zero IBU beer? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you make a beer that doesn't have hops in it, for one. Or a great example would be a uh, lambic beer. Uh, so uh, a lambic or use uh, or a fruit lambic, those beers are typically zero IBUs. So they use aged hops, uh, which, have, which don't really contribute any type of bitterness. Uh, and the, there's really no emphasis on bitterness in those beers. It's all about acidity and, you know, some type of residual malt flavor and some big fermentation aromatics, uh, but uh, no emphasis on bitterness. Andres asks, once attenuation is reached by X yeast, is it possible to add a second yeast to process residual sugars? And does that bring a positive potential result? Uh, so the first part of that is sure. Uh, there are some yeasts that are going to produce that are going to ferment 
uh, sugars that your regular brewer's yeast won't eat. Um, so you could potentially add yeast that will ferment out further sugars. A great example of this would be Britannomyces. Britannomyces yeast is oftentimes used as a secondary fermenter in bottle conditioning. So you could have a fully uh, attenuated beer. Uh, all the available sugars have been consumed that would be normally consumed by the uh, Saccharomyces yeast. But then in bottle conditioning, you add Britannomyces, and that will eat more complex sugars that a regular Saccharomyces yeast won't eat. So now you have further fermentation. And in that context, that could be a very positive thing and could result in a beautiful beer. Uh, although I wouldn't say that anytime you do that, you could end up with a positive result. I think there's plenty of instances where you can uh, add something else to the beer and ferment it further and end up with something that maybe you don't like. Um, next question. Are the parameters FG, OG, ABV, and attenuation related so that I need to know only one of FG or OG and one more of the others to calculate them all? Uh, so these are all somewhat related. Um, you know, they, they all are part of the bigger picture. Um, so with FG and OG, uh, you know, you, it's, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. Really, the, the you're going to find patterns in there. If you look at FG and OG, you're going to be able to figure out attenuation, but alcohol is going to be a little more difficult to figure out. Um, alcohol uh, gives you some interesting, what it does is it affects the your reading of your gravity. Uh, so your straight up gravity it drops as the gravity drops as fermentation continues, partially because the sugars are being depleted, but also because alcohol is being created and alcohol is lighter than water. So that effect, that skews your numbers a little bit. So in order to get a true alcohol content, you need to uh, go through some type of laboratory analysis, but you can approximate those numbers. And if you're talking about this in terms of examination, uh, it's it's really it's good to know how all those relate uh, and have an idea in your head. Uh, but if you're studying some of these numbers specifically, it's best to study them all kind of individually, and you know, and it'll be easier to understand and to absorb and to remember if you know how they relate to each other. I hope that helps. Next question, how much error is allowed from real ABV to the one shown on the label? Uh, that is, uh, you know, that's going to depend on, uh, you know, I don't know the actual regulation on that. So there, there is some wiggle room in there. Uh, I want to say it's, you know, it's a fraction of a percent. Uh, but I don't know the actual legal uh, regulation as to how much wiggle room there actually is. Uh, why are there no BJCP categories for nitro beers? Well, nitro beer is really a method of dispense. It's not really a style. So what you find is that, for example, uh, uh, an Irish stout is uh, kind of a classic example of a beer style that is served uh, as a nitrogenated beer, but it's not always served that way. Uh, and then there's other styles of beer which can be served as a nitro beer as well, like uh, like a pale ale, an English pale, or a, or an IPA. Uh, you you can see, you know, you can find uh, all kinds of different beers if you look hard enough uh, that are produced on nitro. So it's more a method of service as opposed to an actual beer style. Um. Let's see. We have one last question here. Uh, in wine, you can acidify or chaptalize wines to change the ABV and acidity levels. Uh, can you do that in beer? If so, would the attenuation and ABV potentially not correlate if the levels were changed? Um, 
so yeah so this is a this is an interesting question um really i think a good answer to that is uh so if you're adding sugar to boost abv uh that that changes the dynamic um so acidifier capitalized to change ABV and acid city levels. Uh, yeah, I mean you you can do that. Uh, I'm trying to understand this question and exactly what you're getting at. Uh, can you acidifier capitalized wines to change ABV and acidity levels? Can you do that in beer? You can certainly you can certainly add uh, sugar to change ABV levels, would the attenuation ABV potentially not correlate? Uh, yeah, I mean, that changes the way you figure attenuation for sure if you're adding sugars. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't really have a good straightforward question for that or answer for that one. Um, did the Belgian shoof gnome rotate to look at the camera? <laughs> Uh, Marcel back there uh, has been watching over me this whole time. Um, he may have shifted in place while I was talking. Uh, if so, uh, um, you know, I don't really know what to say, but he might be, he might be doing that. Um, okay. Well, that is the end of the questions. Uh, thank you again for joining. Make sure you hit that subscribe button at the bottom and subscribe to the Cicerone channel. Uh, join me next Tuesday, May 19th, same time, 1 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be talking about German and Czech style beers. Uh, and until then, have a great weekend. Thanks a lot for joining, and we'll see you later.